in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, over 1,000 kilometers from land. There is a floating island of plastic trash, said to be twice the size of Texas. We wanted to find out what is really out there, how big it is, and what impact it's having on wildlife and the oceans. So we joined up with a team of scientists on a sailing expedition across the Pacific. What we discovered was more disturbing than anything we could have imagined. Welcome to our plastic ocean. Hey everyone, I'm Tyler. And this is my younger brother, Alex. And together, we're the Water Brothers. We're gonna take you on an adventure around the world to explore the state of our blue planet, a planet defined by water and its ability to sustain life. So join us on our journey as we explore the world, looking at the most important water stories of our time. And together, we will learn how to better protect our most precious resource. Our journey to the garbage patch began in the remote Marshall Islands, a nation of over 1,000 small islands in the South Pacific, once used as an important staging ground for the American Navy in World War II. The remnants of its military past were everywhere. Today, the most visible legacy of American influence is the endless supply of imported plastic products scattered all across its shorelines. The Marshall Islands have joined the modern world of disposable plastic, but with no capacity to recycle. The main island of Majuro is so small, there was nowhere to bury the waste. Even the coral reefs had become a dumping ground for plastic as it washed out to sea. The Marshall Islands are home to only 50,000 people, and they could not create such a massive garbage patch by themselves. Every country on Earth, big or small, rich or poor, is contributing to the plastic trash on the planet and in the oceans. Plastic lasts forever, and if it's not recycled or properly disposed of, it can easily wash down storm drains, into lakes and rivers, and then out to sea. After all, the ocean is downstream from everyone. Now it was time for us to get on board and see what is happening to plastic once it leaves land and reaches the open ocean. To journey to the middle of the Pacific, we would be sailing a 72-foot steel-hulled yacht called the Sea Dragon. It was built for one of the great around-the-world sailing races and was designed to handle some of the ocean's worst conditions. So we're just leaving Majura right now. We can't help but notice all the tuna fishing boats that were surrounded by it. And it's a little bit ominous because we know that on our journey, we're going to be encountering a lot of fishing nets that have been discarded from boats just like these. Joining us on our expedition was a diverse group of 14 people that included scientists, Probably students, yeah. sailors, and even business leaders from the plastics industry. The Western the last one Leading our team was Dr. Marcus Erickson, co-founder of the research organization Five Gyres, who has dedicated over seven years to the study and elimination of plastic pollution in the ocean. So right now in the Marshall Islands, and we're gonna go about 2,400 miles to Tokyo. In between, we're gonna hit the Western Garbage Patch, the North Pacific Gyre. Driven by wind and the force of the Earth's rotation, gyres are part of a complex network of currents that circulate water all around the world and rotate in a clockwise direction in the Northern Hemisphere and counterclockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. There are five large gyres in the world's oceans, two in the Pacific, two in the Atlantic, and one in the Indian Ocean. So these five subtropical gyres make up roughly 40% of the oceans, which in turn make up roughly 20% of the planet's surface. These gyres are also accumulation zones for floating trash. So things like, like glass, light bulbs, fluorescent tubes, um, metal if they're closing air, like a propane tank, um, or plastics, a lot of plastics. Gyres are the natural forces that collect and push floating debris into concentrated areas. But plastic is not natural. It does not biodegrade. So as plastic debris is pulled in by the gyres, it can remain trapped there for decades or longer, being pushed in a slow spiral. 
All right, well, Todd and I have never been this far away from land before, or at sea for this long. Really? So yeah, no, we're really excited to- uh, for a surprise. We're it's definitely for a surprise. Hopefully not too much seasickness as well. There was no turning back, and hopefully we didn't forget to bring anything, because we would not see land for nearly three weeks. Scientists had long predicted that floating debris could be accumulating in areas like the North Pacific Gyre. But it wasn't until 1997 that a boat captain named Charles Moore stumbled upon what would come to be known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch when he switched on the engines of his catamaran and took a shortcut on his way home to California from Hawaii. It was a decision that would change Captain Moore's life forever. And it was because we took that shortcut that I got involved in this plastic pollution issue because I couldn't come on deck without seeing plastic pollution. No matter what time I came on deck, if I just stood there and looked into the water for a short while, I would see something plastic floating by. So this started working on me. It wasn't like an aha moment. Oh, I found the garbage patch. There's a trash island. It was day after day, hour after hour, time after time, happening to see something floating by that didn't belong there. Captain Moore kept returning to the gyre to document how much plastic was actually out there and use his findings to educate the public. On each trip, Moore and new colleagues like Marcus Erickson were able to perfect a method for gathering data by modifying trawling devices normally used to study plankton. Yeah, so we just put in our first trawl, uh, trawling for uh, plastic in the ocean here. Tell us a little bit about this trawl, because I know we have two different types of trawls on board. Yeah, so this is the high-speed trawl. So typically oceanographers deploy a manta trawl to slow speed, like two or three knots to skin the sea surface. Then they'll pick it up and they'll go like 50, 60 miles to the next trawl. All that time in between, nothing happens. So we invented this one, the high speed. It allows us to go about 10 knots and still collect a sample. So this one, we just deployed this. We're gonna drag this on the ocean surface for about maybe 100 miles and see what's in it. A second device, the slow speed manta trawl, is able to collect even more precise measurements and is equipped with a spinning flow meter that measures how much water passes through the net so we can determine the average amount of plastic in that water. So we got another few hours before the sun sets. We're gonna trawl all night long and you'll see in the morning we'll take it out and this will be the first evidence in about 25 years of the western half of the North Pacific Gyre. Mm -hmm. And compared to last journeys, like how often do you pull out plastic when you do these trawls on either the high speed or with the manta trawl? You know, I've been, I've been doing this for about six, seven years, and we pulled up, I'd say, between four to 500 trawls. Only twice has there not been plastic, and that was last year in the South Pacific. So uh, I'll be surprised there is isn't plastic here. We expect to find some. We're not sure how much. Hold the trawl up to examine its contents. The thing you can't help but notice are these two giant pieces of foam. Uh, they look a little bit like uh, waffles, I'm thinking. What, do you, what, do you, what, what does it remind you of? A taco. A taco? Except for these large pieces of foam, most of the plastic we found were small fragments. We knew plastic does not fully biodegrade in seawater, but over time, waves and sunlight were combining to break the plastic down into smaller pieces. And since it doesn't biodegrade, the plastic out here will never go away. It will continue to float in the ocean for decades or longer, slowly breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces until it is mistaken for food by an animal or washes up on shore somewhere hundreds of kilometers away. So these will dry out or rinse them off real quick. Yeah. Let them dry. The rest will put into a sample jar to save a say for later analysis. That analysis is simply to count the particles, uh, weigh them uh, in different size classes, look at the type of plastic. And that kind of descriptive data kind of tells us how big these garbage patches are and what their contents are, and gives us a baseline to monitor. We weren't even close to the heart of the garbage patch, but our first trawl sample was full of plastic. Equally disturbing 
we realized we were only collecting the plastic that floats. Amazingly, 50% of all plastic sinks in seawater, so we could only see half the problem. We began to notice that some of the plastic pieces had bite marks on them. Animals were eating the plastic. But this came as no surprise. Marine life, such as whales and turtles, are increasingly being found washed up on shorelines full of plastic. On the massive seabird colony of Midway in Hawaii, not far from the garbage patch, tens of thousands of seabirds die of starvation every year after eating things like plastic lighters and bottle caps they mistake for an easy meal. It actually gives them a, a false sense of, of satiation. They feel they're full when they're not. What they're full of is a non-nutritive material. So they dehydrate, they lose their muscle mass, and they become weakened and more susceptible to disease and death. There are documented cases of over 660 different species impacted by ingesting plastic and by entanglement, with the number of deaths estimated in the millions. Plastics can absorb all kinds of pollutants. So no off our streets, oil, oil drops are dripping off of cars and it adds to millions of gallons annually washing off our streets. That's in the ocean, mixing around, not mixing in water, but sticking to plastic. So it isn't just the plastic itself, it's some of the things that absorb onto that, that when a fish eats it, may desorb into their body as well, eventually into your, into your body when you eat them. I had this one rafting voyage years ago, drifting about one and a half knots for three months to Hawaii, caught a fish in the middle of that trip, a little rainbow runner, opened the stomach just out of curiosity, and 17 little microplastic particles popped out, and I know they carry pollutants. We're eating our own garbage in a way. Yes, through various stages of, of consumption uh, up the food chain to us, we are eating our own trash. Fish that are killed by ingesting plastic will not likely wash up on shore, so it is difficult to tell which species are eating plastic unless you catch one yourself. Awesome. Yeah, first fish of the trip. The first one we caught was uh, probably like a huge marlin and it took the line right off, but this time we got a nice wahoo, so fresh fish for dinner. After filleting the wahoo and examining its stomach contents, there was no sign of any plastic fragments. Thankfully, this one was safe to eat. As the days passed, we became adjusted to life on board the Sea Dragon. The living quarters were tight, and we kept busy on constantly rotating shifts to keep the research going day and night. Multitasking was critical, and aside from helping with the research and sailing, everyone was expected to keep the ship running efficiently. Probably one of the most important parts of any boat is the washroom, which is also known as the head. And uh, right here, one of the unique functions of the head is actually the pumping system and the flushing system. So for the sake of time, I've uh, preheated the oven here. And you just all you have to do is open the hatch, and you have to pump 20 times. All right, so you close the valve. So it's a little bit of work, but you know, so you get a little sweaty, it's a little stinky in here, we've got the sun beating down on us. So one of the things you want to do is take a shower. Well, the lucky thing for all of us here is that you're already in the shower. So just take a seat, take up the sink, and start washing. Keeping an eye out for any plastic debris we spot in the ocean. Right now, we're seeing small pieces about every 10 minutes. But as we get closer to the accumulation zone, I think we're going to start seeing more pieces and more frequently. Yes. It looks like we got a laundry detergent bottle of some kind. We're not sure quite what it is, but. It's pretty obvious that there's a lot of life on it, and obviously that would interest you as a marine biologist. So tell us a little bit about what interests you about marine debris and uh, what you're seeing on this bottle here. I study a variety of aspects of it, but one of the main ones that interests me is how plastic debris serves as a raft to transport species around the ocean to either new places or to uh, help expand their populations. So there's a whole community of organisms that's adapted to live on floating objects. And as we're seeing now, with the abundance of plastic, there's some new, uh, new players in the community, so. 
plastic rafts have the ability to cross vast distances. So scientists like Dr. Carson are trying to determine if these more durable rafts could act as vehicles for introducing invasive species to new continents and across entire oceans. So here we are, we've reached the center of the Western Pacific garbage patch. And the first question everyone wants to ask about this problem is, where is this giant mound of plastic twice the size of Texas or the size of Texas? And the truth is, is that it doesn't exist. We are seeing a lot of larger pieces of plastic. Right now we're seeing the most we've seen all trip. About every two minutes we're either spotting a piece or pulling one up on board. But the real story is much scarier than a giant mound of plastic because it's actually become part of the entire marine food chain. You don't find bags or bottles, but what you do usually find is a bag or a bottle broken down into a thousand pieces. It's become part of every drop of seawater that we pull up in the plankton trawls. That's where the true story is. As our trawl samples had shown us, the entire ocean has become the garbage patch we originally set out for. So you hear about this, this mountain or island of trash in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. What people need to know is that if the entire gyre has these microplastic particles and larger, larger pieces, tangle balls of net, the occasional bottle, bottle cap washes by, but so spread out, if you lump it together, it is that island. It does exist, it's just been exploded into you know, trillions of microplastic fragments. So we're an island, I mean, relatively speaking, you could say that would be a better issue. You could fix it, you can go get it and clean it up. When, it, when it's a mountain of microplastic fragments distributed around the world, that's impossible to clean up, and it's much worse for the animals that live there. The United Nations estimates that there are over 46,000 pieces of plastic floating in every square mile of ocean surface. So how could we ever hope to clean up these tiny particles of plastic spread across such a vast area? It was a tough reality for us to accept, but the accumulation zone still had another problem to reveal to us. So we just came across our first fishing net, or net ball. And these things are really amazing to check out because when these giant fishing nets are left behind by fishing boats after they get broken or too tangled to bring back to port, they usually just throw them overboard. But what's really interesting is that they become a floating habitat for all sorts of marine life. I got my uh, underwater camera ready to go, so we're gonna hop in and see what kind of life is hanging around it, so I'm pretty excited. A netball is like an island in the middle of an empty ocean. All kinds of life make the ball home and find shelter amongst its tangled ropes. It was ironic to think that these nets, that were once used to kill fish, had now become their home. But as we peeled apart the countless layers of netting, we began to notice consumer items caught up in the nets and even dead fish inside. The nets were still catching fish. We tried our best to free any that were still alive, even though we knew it wouldn't do much good. Some of these fish were coastal species that would struggle to survive in the harsh open ocean once we freed them. There are hundreds of small bits of plastic stuck in this bolus. Yeah, so, so just this one netball's caught more microfragments than we have in probably all of our trawls so far. 35 different species of marine life were living within the netball, including several types of crabs, shrimp, worms, and fish. We had stumbled upon an entire floating ecosystem. We have to understand that what we do on land has an impact it may be 10 years, maybe 10,000 miles. Everything you do makes a difference to the oceans. Everything. We're about 640 miles south of Japan, and we just pulled in a manta trawl, and it's definitely the thickest one full of plastic we've found yet. We're just looking through this, this sample right here. It's almost too many pieces of plastic to count. We're also seeing a lot of these pre-production pellets, uh, also known as nurdles. Uh, that's sort of the nickname that they, they've gotten among the marine debris community. And these things are what plastic really looks like before it becomes the consumer items that we're used to seeing in our daily lives. Nurdles are so small, cheap, and abundant that countless numbers of them are lost during industrial spills every year and wash out to sea 
without ever being turned into a useful product. The very things that make plastic so desirable, its cheapness and durability, are the exact same things that make it so dangerous to the ocean. We sat down with crew member Michael Brown, the owner of a plastic packaging company who is engaging his industry to embrace a policy known as extended producer responsibility that encourages companies to be responsible for the products they produce for their entire life cycle. Producers begin to bear some expense for what they put in the marketplace. And, that, and if they're gonna pay the price to dispose of it, they'll start to make things that are easier to dispose of and are less uh, dangerous for the environment. 80% of what we're seeing is coming from the land. Only 20% is being generated at sea by commercial shipping and fishing. So if we address the problem on land, which I believe the plastics industry is well aware of, and actually funding some litter efforts, those efforts will help. As a secondary effort and sort of a high-tech effort, uh, there's a move towards bioplastics and bio-derived plastics that I think in the next 50 years will be the solution. Bioplastics are derived from biomass sources such as corn and other vegetables. But the higher cost of these products in comparison to traditional plastics has made it difficult for them to compete. We were encouraged, though, to learn from crew member Valerie Lecoeur about her line of bioplastic products. So I have a line of biodegradable beach toys. They are the world first biodegradable beach toys. And they're made with a bioplastic called PHA and it's the only plastic certified to biodegrade in marine environments. So if that little cup gets uh, washed out to sea, it will take two to three years for it to biodegrade. Microbes in the environment will eat the plastic away and it will go back to nature. It's different from regular plastic, who as you know, you know they photodegrade, uh, so they never really go away. Bioplastics have tremendous potential, but as we sat down in front of a pile of debris collected during our voyage, we wondered, what else can be done to slow down the flow of plastic into our oceans? Can we recycle our way out of this problem? There's no way. That is, that is the biggest myth that's been, uh, uh, been, been put on the public. Telling people, keep consuming, but then recycle your trash. To see recycling being touted as a solution is just nonsense. It's, it's part of it, yes, it is part. But so much more has to happen. Recycling is part of the solution, but not all plastics are recyclable, and most plastic that can be recycled is never recovered. Globally, over 300 million tons of new plastic is produced every year, and that number is rapidly growing. So a much more effective action is to reduce our consumption of plastic products and packaging altogether. We need plastics that time dispose alongside the products are meant to protect. We're over-packaging products. We have items like coffee stirrers that have a useful lifespan of 60 seconds that last for 60 years, and just not right. This is a problem that's gonna require everyone on the planet's participation to solve. We're all polluters with plastic. We've got to get into the mind's eye of every individual on the planet that there's a whole world that we're ruining with our persistent plastic waste. We finally reached Japan, and we're just pulling into Yokohama right now, which is just west of Tokyo. We're really excited to finally touch land and get these sea legs off and see what it's like to stand on solid ground for the first time in a long, long time. Our journey across the Pacific was an incredible experience. And going in, we definitely had some misconceptions about what the garbage patch really was and how huge the problem really is. So where do we go from here? Because it would be impossible to clean up all the plastic in our oceans. Exactly. And the solution starts right here on land. And there's a lot we can be doing to stop plastic from reaching the ocean in the first place. To start, we all need to try and reduce our consumption of single-use disposable plastic. We need to improve recovery and recycling rates, and we need the plastic industry and businesses to take greater responsibility for the waste they create. And the power lies in all of us to make this difference. 
And if we demand these things as consumers, we will see the changes we need to help create a healthier ocean and a healthier planet.